All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this uh, Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center webinar. Uh, the topic um, for today is traffic signals. Uh, so if you're interested in signals or maybe you want to learn more about what traffic signals can, uh, can do to help accommodate and, and improve bicycling and walking, this is a great session uh, for you. We have an excellent panel. Uh, I'll introduce them soon. Um, this is actually the first of a two-part series that we're hosting with ITE. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. Before we get into some of the detail of the webinar, I do have a few housekeeping items uh, that I wanted to share with you. Um, first, you will be, as attendees, in listen-only mode uh, during the webinar. Um, so we won't be able to talk to you, but you do have the ability to submit questions to us. There's a questions pod in the GoToWebinar control panel. We encourage you to submit questions and comments at any time. We will be holding about half an hour at the end of the webinar just to answer and respond to your questions. So send them in. We'll get to as many as we can uh, during that period. Um, we've posted uh, a webinar archive for this session. We've already got the PDF copy of the slide presentation up online. If you visit that website, pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars, you can find that. We'll be posting a recording of the webinar later this afternoon. So that'll all be there for you in case you want to share it with someone who missed it or want to refer back to something. We have a live transcript being provided for this webinar. I'll drop the link in the chat shortly. Um, we, uh, so if you need a live transcript or a live captioning, um, that'll be available to you. We're going to send an email later today uh, with information about how to get a certificate of attendance for the webinar, professional development hours. We have the webinar approved for 1.5 CEM credits by the American Institute of Certified Planners. So if that's uh, a credit you usually look for, please visit their website to learn more about that. Um, as always, we encourage you to review previous episodes. Uh, we did a couple of sessions on, on signals a few years back. We might refer to those today. Uh, there's some great information out there um, on, on a whole different uh, set of topics that we've covered and will be covering in future webinars. Uh, for example, we have one on Tuesday on, on arterials and pedestrian safety. We hope you'll uh, consider signing up for that. The second part in this series will be held, as I mentioned, by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, Tuesday, July 13th. Um, many of the panelists from today will be on that session. We also have some folks from the Seattle Department of Transportation will be on that session to provide a bit of information about their practices. Um, if you are in a community where maybe you're attending today, but your signals engineers, your signal maintenance operations folks um, aren't in attendance, this is a great uh, webinar to invite them to. Uh, get them signed up. It's another free webinar. Um, so if they miss this one, it's a great opportunity to bring them into this conversation and talk about some of the same topics. Again, I'll drop the link to register for that webinar uh, in the chat pod. Um, I'd like to now introduce you to the panelists who are joining us today. Uh, we uh, will hear first from Darren Buck, uh, who is the Pedestrian and Bicycle Program Coordinator in the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Human Environment, uh, who oversees a variety of projects to research and promote safe, comfortable, and complete networks for bicycle and pedestrian travel. Uh, prior to this role, Darren managed the Complete Streets program at the city of Alexandria, Virginia, and was bicycle and bike share planner at the District of, Colum of Columbia Department of Transportation. Uh, so we're pleased to have Darren here with us. Um, Eddie Curtis is with us as well. He's a traffic management and operations specialist with the FHWA Office of Operations and Resource Center Operations Technical Service Team. He manages the Traffic Signal Systems Program, which is responsible for advancing objectives and performance-based approaches to traffic signal management and operations. Uh, he's a registered professional engineer in California and is a member of the TRB Traffic Signal Systems Committee. Welcome, uh, Eddie. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll hear from Peter Kuntz as well. Peter is a transportation engineer from Portland, Oregon, who is committed to innovative treatments that improve the safety of multimodal travel. Uh, he's served as an adjunct professor at Portland State University, teaching graduate level courses in transportation engineering. He's a member of the Bicycle Technical Committee of the National Committee of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and was past chair of the Transportation Research Board's Committee on Traffic Signal Systems. Peter's active with multiple professional societies, including the Institute of Transportation Engineers, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, and the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals. Um, and finally, we're joined by Peter Firth, uh, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Northeastern University. A longtime bicycling advocate, educator, and researcher, Peter received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals for his pioneering work in level of traffic stress. He's lived, studied, and taught in the Netherlands, uh, from which he says he has drawn endless inspiration for making our cities more hospitable to bicycling, walking, and public transportation. Uh, so we have a great panel. I don't want to take any more of their time. Uh, and what I'll do next is turn it over to uh, Darren Buck. Uh, to get us started. Uh, Darren, please go right ahead. 
All right. Thanks a lot, Dan. I'm, I'm really honored to be here with, with these three other panelists. Um, uh, long ago, I worked with Eddie in the Office of Operations and was, was tagging along behind him, often saying, let's think about heads and bikes and signal operations. And he was always a, a willing ear for that. Uh, Peter uh, introduced me to his concept of the invisible urbanism of signals, and that always hung with me, uh, how you can make a city immeasurably better. Uh, by good signal operation practices. Uh, and, and finally, Peter, when I was when I left Federal Highway uh, and became a baby bike planner, uh, Peter taught me a, um, a back of the envelope traffic analysis method that I've, I've successfully deployed three times uh, to, uh, to, to get better intersection design. Uh, and uh, I am a, definitely a, an adherent to the level of traffic stress uh, methodology and, and a big fan of it. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about this, this framework that's up on your screen right now. Um, so back in 2016, uh, Federal Highway published our strategic agenda for pedestrian and bicycle transportation. Um, it laid out 98 different action items across these four broad goal areas uh, that are shown here that guided our work through this calendar year. Um, right now, we're doing a, a small look back exercise within Federal Highway. Um, to see what we've done, where we still have some work to do, and what we might think about doing next. Um, signals aren't something that's mentioned a whole lot uh, within this action plan, but when you think about it, signal design and signal operations cut across all four of these areas. Um, networks, any safe, accessible, connected, comfortable network uh, can effectively end at an intersection that either does not have a signal or has a signal that doesn't do a good job of managing separating those different users effectively and comfortably. Um, safety, obviously, when that breakdown occurs in net network connectivity, that's a huge safety issue. Um, I, I don't really need to, to prove that point. Um, under equity, as with the entire transportation system, we really need to critically ask and examine if our signal hardware resources, if our uh, signal operations work, our management work, has an equity dimension. Are we providing these resources in proportion to the need? Um, how does that relate to the disproportionate pedestrian safety uh, problem that we see at a national level right now um, in low-income communities and, and communities of color? And finally, uh, our TRIPS item, it, it's not only about encouraging more walking and biking, um, but measuring biking and walking and TRIPS. Um, our signals architecture and our ITS architecture and even our operations where we're collecting intersection counts plays a huge role in collecting TRIPS data um, in a very distributed and, and perhaps unbiased way. Um, so in that way, I, I, kind of, I kind of view signals as, as something that's woven throughout. And so I'm super happy to uh, be part of this series where we're sort of uh, hopefully bridging the gap a little bit uh, between head bike practice and, and signals practice. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Eddie. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Darren. And I too want to extend a uh, thank you to Dan and Darren and uh, Peter and Peter uh, for allowing me to be a part of this panel. Um, you know, very excited to sort of get into this area to talk more uh, comprehensively about how traffic signal systems can begin to um, actually consider, or maybe I shouldn't use the word actually, but maybe more adequately consider uh, the needs and objectives of pedestrians. And so I've, I've been managing FHWA's traffic signal program for over 10 years, and there's no denying that this program um, has for a long time been very vehicle centric. And so the question that I had to ask myself was, how do you begin to change that orientation towards, you know, mostly being focused on vehicles? And so from my view, there have been a number of traffic signal report cards, other benchmarking efforts, data collected from state and local agencies. But the reality is that over on the left, uh, most of what happened or has continued to happen in signal systems has largely been based on, say, best practices. And so, you know, there's this continuum of how things are done, and a lot of it's happening down at a very strategic level. And so working through how traffic signal or just really um, how transportation programs are funded, you really have to begin to think about how to impact capital programs 
and how to direct funding into how we're thinking about how we're providing, you know, designing, operating, maintaining traffic signals in all transportation infrastructure. And so what we've done probably over about the last five years is to really think about how signal systems can better be engaged in the planning process. And that meant really looking more um, adequately at goals, you know, thinking through what are the needs of the communities, how are agencies articulating the needs of their constituents, the people that live there. And so we've built a framework and, you know, I like to think of it as this objective driven um, performance based program, but it's thinking through how are goals articulated? How do you ingest those and think about context? So the communities that we're in, whether you're in a central business district, a residential area, a linear arterial, a freeway interchange, and to consider the needs of all the users in that context. And then from that, beginning to evaluate how you develop objectives. And that's the part where we have to actually think about how are we providing for the needs of all of these users? How do we prioritize those needs? Um, and so something that I had to come to grips with when I was doing my graduate work at Georgia Tech, I was working with Carrie Watkins, and she actually said to me, the way that you talk about pedestrians is offensive. Um, and at that point, I, I thought <laughs> that I was pretty engaged, but I think because I grew up through this sort of traditional approach to how we do signal design and operations, it wasn't that we didn't consider pedestrians first. You know, we weren't considering all of the goals equally. We we're often focused on things like congestion, and then that breaks into recurring and non-recurring congestion. But you know, it, it, it needs to be thinking thinking about things at the higher level of things like livability, mobility, um, accessibility, and then think about how to actually execute those things. So we've built that into a lot of the products that are now coming out of the traffic signal program. So things like the signal timing manual, even when we're talking about system engineering for new systems, we're pulling engineers up into this discussion of goals and you know how do you deal with safety? How do you deal with mobility and reliability and livability and really consider the needs of all the users on an equal footing? So. Um, that objectives-based approach is something that we've worked um, a lot on, have gained a, a better understanding of, and you're starting to see performance measures in systems like automated signal performance measures. There are measures that can actually evaluate service to pedestrians, service to bicycles. So we're sort of making that pivot, but it really needed to be something that getting out of this strategic level focus on how we do design and bringing it up and starting with the goals and then diving down into that. So that's very much a part of the products that we are putting out. And so even things like equity, you know, that's something that we really need to think through in terms of how that impacts signal design, signal operations. So, but I think you need this framework to begin to broaden how you think about it. And that's where the signal program is really focused right now. So um, hopefully I haven't taken too much time. I really want to say, Time for Peter Koontz and Peter Furt. I know they have a lot of great information to share. And so I'm gonna stop talking and hand it off to Peter Koontz. Okay. Thanks very much, Eddie. Uh, Peter, the screen's coming to you. Um, let's get right into it. All right. Yeah, Eddie provide a great framework from which to jump off of. So I think the notion of his perspective on how pedestrian and cyclists are incorporated and encouraged in our traffic signal systems has been, I'd say, a mixed bag over time, if not uh, forgotten. And I think that's where Peter Firth and I will kind of take you on a journey to try to think about how you might approach this from the perspective of improving traffic signals for people walking and cycling. So just to get into this. Uh, we're going to talk about design. We're going to talk about various elements and changing the practice. Uh, I'm going to start us off. I'm going to hand it over to Peter, who's going to kind of get, dig into some of the research that he's been doing. And then I'll, I'll give you some more examples as a, as a part of the uh, kind of the recap of, in terms of where do you go from here. This is a two-part uh, webinar, so we're excited about this and then also the companion work that we're going to be doing with the Institute of Transportation Engineers next month. So, you know, where do we start? I think 
committee's slide was a great example. Uh, we, you know, thinking about policies and, and how that informs traffic signal decisions. I think often as a traffic signal engineer, left to my own devices, I will just make a decision without a lot of public input, a lot, out a lot of consultation of policies. And that's where we want to change the profession a bit to make sure that planners are having some opportunities to change the operations, maintenance, and other elements like equity that are coming into the profession so that we can develop a better performance overall for the public. So let's start with policy. The policy really is it should be re thinking about what the effect of signals are. And so this notion of, you know, in Portland, we have this green transportation hierarchy on the right hand side of the slide, where it says put pedestrians first. And then the argument is, gosh, are we really doing that at traffic signals? And, and I think that's what we're going to hope to try to provide with you is levels of that where, where we can say, yes, for sure, we know pedestrians are at the top of, the, of, the, of that triangle. Uh, and, and then other cases where maybe we could do a lot better. And so, you know, it really starts, policy start from a plan of being able to write down what it is you expect. And so in Portland, we have the Portland Bicycle Plan for 2030. It really sets out specific strategies. And I think, you know, not only cycling, but also pedestrian plans really are informative. And I think, again, getting engineers to the level of engagement that they can know what their role is on these plans is really important for moving us forward. So writing plans are actionable. I think that's the key message that I want to try to start you off with, you know, and, and five basic principles in doing that. So we'll try to get to most of these principles here and feel free to jump into the chat and ask questions about this. But, you know, it starts with counting people, not cars. You know, what what gets measured gets done is the old, you know, the old, the old perspective that that uh, I've heard in the industry for quite some time. And I think you know one could argue that we haven't done as good a job of measuring and tracking performance as we could. Um, you know, thinking about, gosh, well, why aren't people using it today? Well, maybe it's because it's not safe. And so, obviously, Peter's bicycle level of traffic stress is a great example of trying to measure the difference in levels of stress. Um, thinking about multimodal advantage and then, you know, thinking about the existing guidance that's out there. I'll give you some specific examples of where folks have been rewriting that existing guidance. So let's just start with, you know, a basic premise. I think as Darren mentioned, you know, we, we have existing traffic signal equipment out in the field. This is an example of a, you know, recent implementation in Portland and, and where, okay, we've got a buffered bike lane. Uh, and what's shown there in the in the little graphic is a detector. And we can use that detector, depending on how we get that data back from the intersection, we can use that to count people at traffic signals, in this case, counting bikes that cross over to the detector. That's a simple technology. That's a technology that is at most people's disposal today. But the question is, are we using that? Or are we gonna do a separate counter that would be completely separate that somebody else would have to maintain? I think so that's a basic level of, do you know who is using your system and how is the system being used today? Detection for multimodal traffic is still emerging. I'd say that's part of this, you know, is video is video a tool? Is, is our sensors, LIDAR sensors, are all the various things that are being talked about in the, in the tech world, are, are those, you know, are those applicable for us just yet? And I think the answer is there's a range of accuracies and we're still studying this. And, and, and that's where I think FHWA has a great role to play is to continue to share information about what, what agencies are doing and, and, and are we ready to use some of those new techniques on our streets? The, the piece of the puzzle, once you're measuring what's happening on the street system, then you can start to implement a wide range of tools in the toolbox from better crossings to separating vehicles in time. Uh, when I say vehicles, I mean, actually argue that it's really any people at the intersection in time. And, and Peter will talk a little bit about the details of his research on that. You know, thinking of, you know, just simple things as high visibility crosswalks or on-street parking restrictions. You know, we have a range of things that we know are tools, but these should be described in the plans. And so that's why I wanted to highlight this issue for us to start us off before we jump into signals. 
because it signals what we're trying to do. We're trying to separate movements in time. We're trying to keep people safe and we're trying to improve driver behavior. We want improved driver behavior. That's one of the first things you learn when you go to the Netherlands uh, is that driver behavior is wonderful because most people are on their bike at some point during the week or during the year at least, and, and that everyone does a better job of yielding and being respectful on the roadway than what we experience in the US. And part of that is our signal strategies and geometric changes that they've made. So we're gonna try to highlight that as a part of this webinar. If you think about what you're doing in your plan or what you've written in your plan, I think the clarity that we want to leave you with is that we need to measure and track that performance. And so you know, we have this list of countermeasures on the left and you can track those outcomes on the right. And so you know those countermeasures lead to those outcomes. And I think this is where you know if you implement 10 lead pedestrian intervals, I can't really tell you how many fatals and serious injury crashes will be will be uh, will, will, will be prevented from that but it's all a part of the system and ecosystem that we should be working towards to deliver a safer uh, system at traffic signals but for example you know we can say gosh if you're a city of some medium size you know can't you just can't you implement 20 lead pedestrian intervals in a year uh, you know obviously these things all take a little bit of budget and time and, and effort but you know that's a sample for what a plan might include to make sure you're tracking progress. One of the things that we've done just recently in Portland is declare that we want an ADA transition plan that incorporates accessibility at every signal, and that's a 20-year plan. So we have a thousand signals. That means we have to do 50 a year, which is a good amount to really get get us towards that all accessibility at every intersection throughout the city. So with that, uh, I hopefully that was helpful to give you the intro. Uh, Peter is going to dive in a bit to the research and talk about what he has been studying and ways in which he wants to make intersections safer. So Peter. All right, great. Uh, let's see if I can find the button for presenting. Uh, ay, ay, ay. So Peter, I'm sending it to you now. Apologies for that. Okay, great. Here we go. Yeah. There um, you go. So I'm really glad that uh, you all are here. Uh, I wish I could see you all, but uh, you, I probably, we probably wouldn't have the hundreds of you that are here if we all had to be in the same room. Uh, let's see. I. Okay, I need to shrink. I need to shrink one view so I can see my slides as well. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I was part of a team that uh, worked on an NCHRP project that produced, we wrote a guidebook for signalized intersections, for making them work better for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, we finished it about uh, more than a year ago. It hasn't been published yet. You might want to ask NCHRP, when is it going to come out? In that guidebook, we had more than 30 techniques. So for today's webinar, I said, 30 is too much. Where, where can we get the most bang for our buck? So I decided to focus on six things you can see the outline here. Uh, I won't spend time on the outline, but you can look and see if you know the topics that you're really interested are there. And maybe some of them will be covered uh, in a in a because because they're related. So the first one is about measuring pedestrian delay. Peter said that this there's this industry maxim that only what's measured counts. And uh, here's a little secret that you should know. The traffic engineers, they all do their intersection analysis and their signal timing design using commercially available software. There are one or two products that are very dominant that people use. Those products always calculate vehicle delay. 
They report vehicle delay. They can tell you the vehicle, the delay for the left turn on the eastbound road, and they can tell you whether that delay is in level, whether that delay makes it level of service A, because it's very little delay, or B, C, D, or F. That software does not measure pedestrian delay. And so it's just, it's just ignored. As a rule, it's ignored. Now, not always, but there are exceptions. So you see here on my screen, I recommend that your city, your state, your agency, whatever it is, make this policy. Whenever vehicular delay is reported, pedestrian delay must be reported too. I know one city, at least, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, that, that has that policy. And then when you report, when you calculate the average pedestrian delay, let's say it's, you know, 35 seconds or whatever it is, then here's a table that you can use to determine, you know, benchmark it. Is it good? Is it bad? It's from the high capacity manual, the 2000 edition. You might ask, well, why, why, don't, why don't you use the more recent edition, Peter? I'm sorry to say, but in the more recent editions, they took it out. They thought they were making an improvement by saying pedestrians care more than about just delay. They also care about how crowded the crosswalk is and how crowded the queuing area is. And they care about uh, safety and conflicting terms. Let's all collapse that into one overall multimodal level of service. And uh, many of you know that multimodal level of service is just, it's nearly impossible to work with. Almost nobody uses it. Nobody knows what it means. If you come out and say multimodal level of service is D, do people go, oh, that's great? Or do people go, that's terrible? Nobody knows. So I recommend you go right just down. Uh, the other things, how crowded it is, sure, you can calculate that too. But pedestrian delay, measure it and look at it against here. And you see, it also includes this column about the likelihood of non compliance. Once the pedestrian delay, average pedestrian delay reaches 40 seconds, and by the way, if average delay is 40 seconds, there's always a bunch of people whose delay is zero, who just you know happen to arrive lucky when the signal was just ready for them to go. So if the average delay is 40, that means somebody's delay is 80, and maybe even 90. So nobody wants to wait that long if they see a break in traffic, and so likelihood of non-compliance becomes high, and that means poor safety. So keeping level of average pedestrian today low is important. Uh, I didn't put on this slide, but just it's very interesting. The city of Amsterdam, they, their policy is that average pedestrian delay must not exceed 40 seconds. That, that's where they put their limit, right here. If you don't make a D, then that, that's not good enough. We got to improve it. Uh, that's certainly not standard American practice, where uh, we, we often have delays way over 40 seconds, sometimes over 60 seconds. So uh, I, here's an example for an intersection in Boston. Uh, newly done, you know, in the, in the 2000 teens, sometime they, a consultant made up a plan. They put in the new uh, they put in the new timing plan, and the average pedestrian delay was 123 seconds when the average vehicle delay was 35 seconds. Now, me and my students, we worked on this and we said, hey, you know, with a little bit of tweaking, we'll give you an alternative plan in which the pedestrian delay is only 45 seconds. And the average vehicle delay, well, it goes up by half a second, but it's basically, there's no change. Well, then why didn't they do this one? The answer is nobody knew that the average pedestrian delay was going to be 120 feet because nobody measured it. Nobody reported it. So that's my first pitch. Now, how do you calculate pedestrian delay when you have a, a simple a pedestrian phase, you know, just a, a single stage crossing, when the walk signal comes on, you cross, then there's a, then there's a form. This, this is a well-known form. Now, the second term in this formula, walk, walk intervals are usually pretty small. And so the second term in this formula 
is usually about one, so you can ignore it. And plus, if there's a push button, you really shouldn't count the second term anyway. And so what the formula simplifies to, since the walk interval is usually pretty small, average delay is, is basically around cycle length divided by two, a little bit less than that. So you got a cycle length of 120 seconds. Yeah, average delay is almost 60 seconds, it's gonna be about 57 seconds. Average delay, I uh, think cycle length is 100 seconds. Your average pedestrian delay is going to be about 46, 47 seconds. Some cities, people that I talk to, they say, oh, we're not like them. We don't have long cycle lengths. And they mean, yeah, we don't have 240 second cycle lengths. Oh, that's great. But if you have a 120 second cycle, unless your walk interval is very long, and for crossing the main street, it never is. If you have a 120 second cycle length, you will have an average delay of about 57 seconds, which means if I go back to this table, you are in level of service E, almost F. Your likelihood of non pedestrian non-compliant is high and you've got bad pedestrian service. It just goes with cycle. Now, if you have a multi-stage crossing, well then you can't, there's no formula you can use. Then you've got to use a, a, a special tool and. Northeastern University where I work. Uh, I made a special tool like this. Uh, it's out, it's, you can, if you Google it on the web, bingo, you get it, it's free. And this will help you to figure out what's the average delay at multi-stage crossings. So second thing, second subject, I wanna talk to you a little bit about coordinated intersections. This is not, in this webinar we aren't, giving you like traffic signals 101, but here's a, so a few things about traffic signals. We have basically two control logics that signals use, either coordinated logic, and that means there's a fixed cycle length. So the, if the cycle length is, for instance, 100 seconds, it means every 100 seconds it, it just repeats. And that allows neighboring intersections to be coordinated with one. So one becomes green, and let's say the other one always becomes green 15 seconds later. So that's a coordinated intersection. In, in a downtown area, yes, so it's all, the intersections are close. Everybody is using down, coordinated intersections. But downtowns usually aren't so bad. What I'm usually talking, what I'm talking about where it's really bad, because in downtown, we often keep our signal cycles short. I'm talking about arterials where often they're coordinated with long signal cycles. The other way, I told you there are two ways. The other way is some people call it running free. Some people call it fully actuated. It means the cycle length, it, it, it can, it's just gonna be whatever it is. We serve one traffic stream when you're all done. We have detectors that know, okay, you're all done. Now we serve the next one until you're all done. Okay, now you're all done, we serve the next one. And if traffic is light, it could cycle very quickly traffic is heavy, it'll take longer to get through. In the US, we use both, but I would say from what I've seen in our cities, 90% of the time, we are using coordinated signals. And I wanna tell you some dirty little secrets about this overwhelming, overwhelming popular practice. The first one is that for cars, it doesn't usually deliver the ethereal green wave that we're all looking for. You know, if you have a one-way street, it's easy to make a green wave. If the travel time from one intersection to the next is 15 seconds, well, then you just have the light turn green 15 seconds later, and then the next intersection 15 seconds later, the next one 15 seconds later, and you have this marvelous green wave. Yes, I agree. Green waves like that are marvelous. I love them. Who doesn't? But when you have a two-way street, and when intersection spacing is irregular, or even if it's regular, but it's not the ideal spacing, and believe me, it never is, well then, you don't really get such a good green wave after all. I mean, I think a lot of you drive cars. Do you get green lights all the time? I think that proves my case, because 
we've got coordinated signals everywhere, but we're not getting green lights all the time. So we're the our, our traffic engineering profession is so devoted to we've got to coordinate, but it's not really delivering what it's supposed to deliver. And then the second thing about for cars, once the cycle length goes above 100 seconds, yes, there's a little increase in capacity, but it's very, very little. And the harm to pedestrians becomes really big. All right, for pedestrians, what coordinated intersections mean is usually it means very long delays. And why is that? It's because when you have a corridor with let's say 10 intersections, one of those intersections will be the most congested one and it needs a long cycle. Now you're forcing all the intersections to have a long cycle, even though they don't need one. But if one needs it, the whole corridor gets that long cycle. So coordination hurts pedestrians in that way. And then coordination also means you get more conflicting turns per cycle. When I say conflicting turns, I think you know what I mean. When you're crossing the street, cars that start in the same direction as you but are, but are turning right are usually allowed to go. And they, you know, there's also a little bit of a little friction between uh, the turning car and the, and, and, and the pedestrian. We want the car to yield. Sometimes they don't. The more cars that are making that turn, well, the more uncomfortable it is. But it depends on the cycle length. So suppose there are 240 cars turning right per hour. If the cycle length is 60 seconds, that's one minute. Well, then there are 60 cycles in an hour. There are only four cars turning right per cycle. If the cycle length is 120 seconds, now there are eight cars turning right per cycle because there's only 30 cycles. When you're trying to cross the street during a walk and cars are wanting to turn right across your path, having four cars per cycle wanting to cross your path, that's actually not so bad. Having eight, that's terrible. So cycle length makes a lot of difference. And then finally, coordinating intersections on these arterials it promotes speeding. So here I wanna show you a study that uh, one of my students just finished. This is an arterial road in Boston, the one that goes right by my university. And the way it's timed now, they, they, they love coordination. And so this, all these green dots, they are, they're part of one coordination zone. And in the, in the AM peak, it's a 100 second cycle in the midday, which is what I'm showing you. It's a 90 second cycle. Why is it 90 seconds? It's because this intersection here needs about 82 seconds and they like to round up to a multiple of 10. Because this one needs 90, now we make all of them need 90. Even though like the intersection I use the most, which is right here, it doesn't need 90 seconds. You stand there and wait as a pedestrian, you see the light turn green for Huntington Ave, maybe six, eight cars go, and then it's empty. There's no cars going. And the pedestrians look at each other and they say, why are we standing here? And they start crossing the street. But meanwhile, a couple hundred feet away, there are some cars coming. And what do they see in front of them? An empty road and a stale green light. And they know that light's not going to stay green forever. And so what's the it, it's the natural motivation is to speed. So we sh we showed how, hey, if instead of forcing the whole arterial to be in one coordination zone, what if we break it into small zones? So these two intersections can cycle with 72 seconds. This one can be by itself at around 80 or 90 seconds, whatever it needs. And these two, these three rather, they can be at 36 seconds with this one, I mean 72 seconds, with this one actually turning around every 36 seconds because it's uh, it only has a pedestrian phase. Well, when we did that, the number of speeding opportunities per hour, which we measured is when a car arrives at an intersection on a stale green and no car in front of them, that's a speeding opportunity. We cut the number of speeding opportunities in half from 1900 to 920. So, there is a basic paradigm that is overwhelmingly popular in the US. And that paradigm is really not that good for, it's not good for pedestrians. It's not good for safety. It's not even that good for cars. 
So we need to push our traffic signal engineers. How about smaller cycles? How about smaller zones? Smaller coordination zones. All right, the third main point I want to make is it should be part of all, all of our signal timing design to try to maximize the walk interval. What you see in this picture, this is what we want to avoid. The light is green for the cars. If it's safe for the cars to cross, well, then why isn't it also safe for the pedestrians to cross? There are a few cases where it might not be if like heavy right turns. But most of the time, if it's safe for the cars, it's safe for the pedestrians. So why is the signal saying don't walk? A lot of times we time our lights like this. Okay, we figure out, okay, the cars need a long green time and then it comes in. The pedestrians, what do they need? Hmm, there's a manual somewhere that says they need a minimum of seven seconds. Okay, we'll give them seven seconds. And then we'll do the pedestrian clearance time, which is based on how long it takes to cross the street. And then it just, and that's all. Why are you giving the pedestrians only seven seconds? Yes, we need this pedestrian clearance time. Put that pedestrian clearance at the end of this phase, and then all the rest can be walked. It won't hurt the cars at all. It won't affect anybody except pedestrians by making it safer to cross the street. Um, well, if you do this, you'll end up with less pedestrian delay. You'll end up with better pedestrian compliance. And then something else that doesn't get talked about enough. We'll make the intersection more accessible to slower pedestrians. When we think about accessibility, some of us too quickly uh, just zoom right to, okay, this means people who are blind, or this means people who are in wheelchairs. There are other categories of people that we want to care about too, and that includes people who can't walk fast, maybe because of they're, they're young or they're very old. Uh, my mother had scars from lung disease, and she just had to walk really slowly. When you time your lights like this, it means a, a really slow pedestrian knows. If, if they know they're slow, they know they have a hard time making it across, start just when the walk phase begins. That's a strategy that they will use. So if I start walking here, I'll see flashing don't walk countdown. I have all this time to cross. Whereas with this one, I start here and then, oh, the flashing don't walk, the countdown starts. And you know, yes, it's true. There's going to be some more time over here before conflicting traffic goes, but I don't know how much it's going to be. And I'm hurrying and hurrying. So maximize the walk interval. How do we do that? For coordinated phases, there is a simple setting that nearly every controller has. There are different makes and so on, but nearly every controller has a setting called rest and walk. So you want to be sure that your engineers are choosing that setting. Um, which will automatically do the calculation that I've shown. But that only works for coordinated phases. For the other phases, like if you've got a main arterial, the cross street, that's the one that's difficult. If you want to cross the main arterial, you're walking with the cross street. That's not the coordinated phase. So for that one, you want to ask, how long does the green usually last? And if the green usually lasts, let's say, uh, well, you know what, that's gonna, that's a little too much detail. I, I'm, I'm gonna skip that now and maybe we'll come back to it if there's a question about it. The main thing is make your walk intervals as long as you can. And in that, uh, in that vein also, we should be making greater use of pedestrian recall. Um, you know, the pedestrian phases come up either because somebody pushes a button, that's called actuation, or the system pushes the button for you, so to speak. It's automatic, and that's called recall. So here are some new guidelines that uh, I, I, I worked on developing. The, the main author was a uh, uh, colleague, Burak Cheshme. Uh, which says, it, it looks at two things. One is how many pedestrians there are per cycle. I think a lot of people understand intuitively, yeah, if there's a lot of pedestrians crossing per cycle, sh it should be on recall. We said if it's over 0.9, definitely on recall. 
And if it's even in the range 0.4 to 0.9, it might be a good idea to have pedestrian recall. But then there's a second factor, which is how long a time does the cross street need the green light? If the cross street needs the green light, about 70% of what the pedestrians need, well then give the pedestrians recall. If, if the cross street is going to be holding, is going to hold onto the green uh, long enough, most of the time, then make it recall. So there are a lot of intersections that don't have recall that perhaps should. Uh, Peter Koontz, anything you want to add about, about this? No, I, I think the pet recall is a, always an interesting question. I think we use policy to really guide us. If we expect there's going to be high pedestrian activity, we'll go ahead and put that recall in. I think that's you know one of those choices that you have to make. And of course, traffic engineering would say, well, it, it wastes time. But I think the argument is also you know look at who's on the various movements. Um, the other downside with pedestrian recalls it may result in transit and bike delay on the other street so these trade-offs are things that we have to take into consideration and weigh uh, and and that's where we really need that measure of performance to really see uh, yeah. if we benefiting the users and does that work for everybody that's out there excellent yeah that's why the number of pedestrians per cycle is so important because um wasting time hurting transit, though that's what happens if you make a pedestrian phase, but there's no pedestrian there to use. It. But if there is a pedestrian, they would have pushed the button and there'd be a pedestrian phase anyway. So you're hardly ever wasting time if most cycles, there are pedestrians. I'll tell you what bugs me is when they make you push a button at, where, at, at a place where there are a lot of pedestrians. So I walk up to the, to the corner, there's already three or four pedestrians standing there. Do you think I'm going to say to them, hey, uh, did one of you guys already push the button? Or would you please guys move out of the way so I can get to the button to push it? I just, just assume that they pushed it. But they assume somebody else pushed it. Nobody pushed it. And then when the light turns green for the cross street and it still says don't walk, do you think they actually stand there and wait? No way. So, yeah, we should be doing recall more often. Okay, a fourth thing. Avoid multi-stage crossings unless you provide good pedestrian progression. I know that in the US, multi-stage crossings aren't that common. So that that and that's a good thing. But sometimes they are. So here's a more or less brand new intersection, just a, a mile or so away from my home. Uh, when I say brand new, the road was totally rebuilt. There used to be an overpass, everything changed. Uh, and it opened up maybe four years ago. So if you're crossing from A to B to C to D, it's a multi-stage crossing. You get a walk signal at A. When you get to B, there's a walk signal telling you whether you can go. And the walk time for this first crossing is different from this one because uh, for this cross street here, the name of the street is South Street, there's a leading left turn. While these left turns are going, well, the, pedestrian, the crosswalk BC is open, but not the crosswalk AB. And so if you actually look at the way it's timed, the average pedestrian delay, if you're walking northbound, is 51 seconds. If you're starting at D, go here to here to here. And with this tool here, we showed how the signal, the, the, the green, this is the, here you can see the green, which is actually the walk for crossing CD. And then there's the green or the walk for crossing BC and crossing AB. You see how they line up and pedestrian can just walk right through. And so the average delay is not that bad. If you say 51 seconds, I thought you said that's bad. That's because the cycle length is 120 seconds. But at least the, 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 the pedestrian partial crossings are well coordinated. There's no harm from it. But walking south, yikes. You see with this average delay? 241 seconds. 60 is enough to get you F. So this is 4F. And why is it? It's because, okay, you arrive, this is the, the, the blue lines, right? You arrive and then you, you finally get a green to, to do crossing AB. And when you arrive at the island, oh, sorry, BC is closed down, please wait. So you wait. When B, then you finally get a walk to make crossing BC. And then you get to uh, 
this this Delta Island at sea, and oh, that crossing on the CD. Sorry, that was very short green, very short green. You missed it. Yeah, yeah. I think this is an example of just it's it's very complicated. I think the you know the delay. Obviously, if you don't quantify that, you 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 should be. And I think that's 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 really a key point here is that no one's going to want to wait for two minutes at an intersection. Absolutely, absolutely. And for four minutes. Uh, and, and, and you know this is this is for real. I mean, yeah. There's there's the there's the good good progression in one direction and the other direction you see the timeline if you can see that small a pedestrian starts at time zero if they comply they don't get out of the intersection until time 300 300 seconds later now pedest uh, engineers they are smart engineers are problem solved engineers they take pride in doing a good job so it's not it, no nobody is proud of having come up with this they never measured the delay. They, they didn't know it. So when I measured this, I reported it to the city and I, and I gave them a new plan because of course I'm curious, I'm, 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 I'm a problem solver. Me and one of my students worked on it and we came up with a plan. The, the, the delay that's, that's now not so bad, 51 seconds, we can get that down to 35 seconds. And this one that's 241, we can get that down to about 52 seconds. So I gave them that new plan, hopefully, Within the next year, they'll do something like that. This is tough, though. There's a lot of crossing with there, so that's that's part of the problem. But the good news is, I think in your next few slides, you'll talk about solutions here. And Peter, just a well, quick. So we're for, a for instance, on time. people ask about slip lanes. You know, so in general, I'm all I'm all in favor of getting rid of slip lanes. But in some cases, this right turn has 600 cars an hour. That is a ton of traffic. You just can't let them and the pedestrian crossings run at the same time. So the, the physical layout, it's not so bad, although I wish the crossing were a little more straight across. So that would make the crossing shorter. Anyhow, we'll get on to other things. So here's my tip about slip lanes. If you do have a slip lane that's signal then please tell your engineers you need to provide two or more pedestrian phases per cycle one per cycle is not enough why because the people who are crossing this slip lane some of them are crossing axis one but some of them are crossing axis two to have good progression for the pedestrian if you make it good for axis one it's going to be bad for axis two you've got to have to, at least two per cycle or even so and, and that's easy to do. We have a technique called reservice. You just provide two or more per cycle. Uh, as a matter of fact, this particular one, the plan that the city says they're going to be doing in sometime in the near future, uh, is to just take this little intersection and make it completely separate from this one. It'll run free. A pedestrian can push a button. It's a hot button. You press that button, boom, right away. The light goes yellow for cars. And in four seconds, you'll have a walk. Uh, the only constraint is once the cars get a green minimum of 10 seconds before you can stop them again but otherwise this could just be pedestrians car pedestrian cars and that way uh very little delay crossing here then you get to wait here and then you cross, you finish your cross so that's the key for the slip lane crossings if the slip lane is not signalized well then you don't have to worry about the signals part but if when you have a signalized slip lane crossing two per cycle minimum please. The next thing is about left turn conflicts. So in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam and most other cities, they have a very, very simple policy. Is it a multi-lane road? Well, then left turns should be protected only. You know what I mean by protected only. Protected is when there's a green arrow to turn left as opposed to when there's just a green ball and you're allowed to turn left after yielding. Turning during that green ball is called permitted. So that's very simple. Uh, the British Columbia policy that Peter Kuntz is gonna be showing you, he's gonna got, uh, got a table with that coming up on one of his slides. Uh, it's, it's like the Amsterdam policy. You just don't do it on multi-lane roads. And then they make some exceptions for very low volume. And they also, uh, 
uh, have guidance, even if it's only one lane, unless it's a low volume left turn, you don't want to have it. So that's a very good policy. Uh, here's, here's a place in, in, in Boston that until about two years ago had permitted left turns. Six lane road, here. six lane road. I sent one of my students out to do some data collection and here are three frames. In the first frame, you see this car is waiting to turn left. I know what the driver is thinking. The driver is thinking, okay, that car is gone, that car is gone. Now it's just a red car. As soon as that red car goes, yes, I'll be able to make my left turn. What the driver doesn't notice is that right here is the elbow of an approaching bicyclist. A little while later, okay, that's a little while later, the bicyclist is a lot closer and that car, the, the red car is gone and the left turning car is going. And now this bicyclist has to shush, clamp on their brakes, shriek to a stop to avoid smashing into that car and being flipped over. So on, if it's a multi-lane road, drivers are paying attention to too many other things. There's too big a chance they're not gonna notice the approaching bicycle. Same thing goes for pedestrians. I remember once when I was driving a car and I was the I was the driver in this car here. Okay, when is there a gap? When can I go? When can I go? Oh, I think yes, after this next car, that's good. Okay, great. And I started to make my left turn and then, oh no, in the crosswalk, there was a pedestrian. I'd been so fixated on when can I, when's there gonna be a gap in traffic? I hadn't made that last scan. And now I'm thinking, oh, oh no lady. Like if, if I keep going, I'll run you over. But if I stop, I'm gonna get hit broadside by a car that's coming at me. Uh, and then the pedestrian, fortunate for, fortunate for me, saved my life, started running. <laughs> Got out of the way so that then I was able to complete my, my uh, my turn and get out of there. That is no way to run an intersection, folks. And now I put the question, I put raise this question, why it is, is it a struggle in the US to make left turns protected only? We do it at some places, but why at so many places do we not want to? This is another one of those dirty little secrets. It's because we have such long cycles because of our coordinated phasing that the delay for the left turning cars is going to be so much. We don't want to delay them so much. So first of all, people's safety is more important than people's delay. And second, if we, if we, you, if we're clever about it, we could reduce the delay for the left turning cars too. And we studied that at this intersection. We showed uh, that using some clever techniques, not just the default, technique of a protected, protect, leading, leading, I, I'm getting to too much detail. The main thing is when you engage the engineers and say, come up with a solution, come on, we know you can do better. We came up with a way to do much better. Protected left turn so pedestrians have a safe crossing and we can get the delay to left turning cars also to go way down. Peter, we have a lot of questions to get through, and uh, yeah, so let's. Uh, the click and right turn is a great example of, uh, of that in, a, in, the, in the mirrored approach. So yeah, jump in on that. That's great. Uh, okay, yeah. So now let me talk about conflicting right turns. They aren't really as dangerous as left turns. The left turns kill and injure more pedestrians and bicyclists than the right turns, and it, you, you can see why. It has to do with the how the speed, a left turn has a, has a less sharp radius, and so they can go at a higher speed than the right turn. Uh, and so right turns, we often will allow them to go at the same time that we're crossing. That's, that's the default. Well, what are some things we can do about it? Well, we can go for full separation, full-time separation, and then there are also some techniques that give us partial protection that give us a time separation at the start, which is when most pedestrians and bicyclists are going. But then 
later on in the cycle, it allows the right turns to go at the same time that pedestrians and bikes might be crossing. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you three techniques for doing that. So first, the full protection. So when you talk about having full protection, a lot of people think, oh, that means having an exclusive pedestrian phase. They have their place, but there's a lot of disadvantages to it. Uh, they lead to very long signal cycles that pedestrians don't like. So I want to emphasize another way of doing separation. And that is you have a separate right turn phase. Like, uh, like here I got a northbound right turn. So that when the northbound traffic is going, the pedestrians are going at the same time. But the northbound right turns, they, they're seeing a red light, a red arrow. Then over here, northbound gets a green arrow and they run. And they run at the same time as this westbound left, which has a turn arrow. And it only stands to reason because whatever traffic conflicts this westbound has, this northbound right has the same one. So let them run at the same time. So they did this recently in, in Cambridge at uh, Cambridge Mass at this intersection. And uh, the bike and pedestrian planner for the city says, oh, it's a night and day difference for pedestrians and bikes. So you can see, for example, here, there's a right turn lane for the cars. So over here, we have a very heavily used bike lane. I mean, this is, this is the most heavily used bike segment of road with bikes on it in the whole Boston metropolitan area. I think in, in peak hours, we're getting 250, 300 bikes an hour. So when the bikes have a green, the right turns have a red. But the right turns do get served because when this left turn runs, well then this right turn runs. And the same thing over here with this right turn, it runs when this left turn runs. So that when the cars have a green to go through here, the bikes also get a green, here's a bike path. The bikes get a green to go through here, and there's no right turn conflicts at all. Fantastic system. Now, the, it, it requires having right turn lanes, and a lot of times people say, oh, we don't have enough space for right turn lanes. A lot of times, if you put the right turns in their own lane, then the through traffic, which you thought needed two lanes, actually, you can get all the through traffic through in one lane. So a lot of cases where there are now, uh, uh, let's say two lanes for, for traffic with right turners using one of those lanes, if you make that right turn lane for right turns only, you don't really need a second lane for through traffic. Not always, but the last time I studied an intersection where that set up, 75% of the time that was the case. We didn't need an additional lane. We could repurpose a lane for right turning cars and be able to get this phasing and a much shorter cycle and better service for everybody. Now, if there's no left turn phase, you can't kind of fit the right turns in with the left turn. So then what do you have to do? Uh, this is something that New York City does a lot of places. Uh, the reason they don't have separate left turn phases is because they have so many one-way streets. So while northbound through traffic is going, we split that phase. Part of it is for pedestrians, and then the second part of it is for the right turns. So you're taking the time, let's say it's, there's 50 seconds for this northbound through phase. So roughly half of that 25 seconds will be for the pedestrians to cross, more or less, depending on how much time, how, how long the crossing is, and then the rest of it for the right turns. So that's a good strategy to use. I just want to uh, put in this word here, believability, which has become an important um, an important uh, catchphrase uh, for Amsterdam, which which also has done a lot of these experimenting with this. And the believability, the question is this: Will the pedestrians and cyclists feel that the signal is protecting them or restricting? Because you're telling pedestrians and po possibly bikes too. You can't go during this time. You can only go during this time. So if the number of cars turning right is few, like 
New York City did this in a lot of places where there were only two or three cars per cycle turning left. The bicyclists quickly learned, ah, during that phase, ah, we just go through it. And Amsterdam learned the same thing. So that's the that that's the key. Where if the if the right turn conflict, if, if it's being made at low speed, and there aren't that many cars turning right, then no need to separate. You can you can let the conflict uh, you can you can allow allow that. All right. Then there are three means of partial protection that are worth uh, mentioning. One is the leading pedestrian interval. Probably everybody on this call knows what that is. Uh, it means there's some leading interval, a leading period of uh, sometimes three seconds, sometimes up to seven seconds, during which no traffic is allowed to go, but the pedestrians are allowed to start. And then we start the concurrent traffic. So that's good, but it has a drawback to it. And the drawback is while no traffic is going, well, no traffic is going which means you lose Peter, we're, 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 we're getting close to the end of time. And I think there is the, the lean press journals does come up in the question. So, okay. I'll, 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 we'll reserve some more time in the July webinar. All right. All right. The second thing is to use a pedestrian intersection, protected intersection layout. Uh, uh, here you see this this drawing actually is a protected intersection layout this very large setback means that pedestrians when they start crossing their way up here while the cars who might be turning right are starting way back here the pedestrians have so much of a head start in space that they don't really need a head start in time if you turn them green at the same time the pedestrians start walking the right turning even if their car is turning right by the time they get there the pedestrian is already well established. So uh, in Amsterdam, where they are able to use this kind of geometry, they don't use a leading pedestrian interval because that would force them to have longer cycles, which means more delay and that sort of thing. Um, and then there's uh, the partial protection using the delayed turn. The idea there is, again, we have a leading interval, but it's not through cars that are endangering the bikes, it's the turning cars. So why don't we let the through cars go at the same time? And then after that leading interval, that head start, that's when we allow the right turns to go. And that this is partial protection, so that the, the, the conflict is still there. But that means the first flush of pedestrians, the first flush of bikes uh, get that protection. So this is really nice because it doesn't hurt intersection capacity. Um, so uh, here's what it's like in, in, in Charlotte. So you see the, the cars are going and uh, the right turning cars are being held for a few seconds. Here's what it's like in New, in New York City. After the, now that when, the, when the, left, the turns are allowed with the flashing yellow arrow. And here's what it's like in Montreal where there's no, where they do it without a right turn lane. So far, no American city has done that yet. Uh, they just start the phase with a green arrow, and then after about seven or nine seconds, the green arrow turns into a green ball, which means if a car is waiting to turn either right or left, they just have to wait. And if you're behind them, well, you just have to wait too. So those are a couple ways to make them safer, and uh, that's the end. And take it away, Peter Kunz. All right, so let's talk a little bit. I'm going to jump ahead a few slides in the interest of time and talk a little bit about, you know, what are those guidelines and, and what have other agencies used? So, you know, what Peter presented was a fantastic array of protected signal phasing guidance. And, uh, you know, that's, I think, a part of, you know, what you should be doing to think through this. We'll, we'll definitely, um, you know, see. Uh, some of those examples from New York City DOT there, MassDOT, Separated Bike Lane Design Guide. If you haven't seen that document, that's another one that's fantastic. And then the, the British Columbia Active Transportation Guide is another new one that's out there that has some information on it. Uh, we'll compare that a bit with the NCHRP Signal Time Manual that Eddie mentioned in his uh, kind of early early parting, uh, starting words here. Um, and then also LADOT has a policy. So, you know, that's 
there's a wide variety of guidelines, a lot of criteria on the left-hand side. What I'll narrow my focus to is for pedestrian and cycling, you know, we really only have a little bit of information here uh, related to, you know, what we traditionally use, uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation uses 200 plus vehicles per hour as the threshold for left turn volume protection. You know, LADOT is the one, I think that's the, the newer on the block that says, gosh, we should really think about pedestrians and compare those with a cross product, multiply the number of pedestrians with the number of traffic, the number of cars per hour that are turning across the pedestrian path. And if that value reaches more than 10,000, then maybe you should protect that right turn or left turn uh, at an intersection. So you have a high pedestrian volumes. If there's a bike lane that's there, their criteria considers that. Um, whereas with the signal time mail, when we wrote that uh, NCHRP document, I think it's report 812, uh, we didn't even consider bicycle criteria as protected left turn. So the state of the practice is evolving. Uh, LADOT was the first to look at protected left turns for cadet people walking. And then this mass dot guide and then the follow-up work at the British Columbia Active Transportation Design Guide said, yeah, let's think about this in a high-speed environment and a low-speed environment. High-speed environment, more risk. So if there are 100 vehicle or 100 vehicle motor vehicles per hour turning across a protected bike lane, maybe that means that we should protect that bike lane uh, and separate that movement in time. And, and maybe we're willing to have higher risk, higher volumes at a lower speed. So this table is something to look at as you think about this and rewrite your existing guidance to really try to provide more safety for people walking and cycling after intersections. Peter mentioned the cycling at a crossroads work that New York City DOT put together. It's fantastic. I, I did a bit of a deep dive into it to really try to get, gather some information. I think Peter's done a nice job of summarizing that today. And then putting this notion of, well, okay, what if we did all that? Uh, what would the outcomes be? And what do those look like in the field? And so I think the notion of this is, how does that then translate into user uh, comfort? Um, you know, the nice thing is they did some surveys. I think you could do the same. I, I imagine the New York City cyclists are a little different than the cyclists in your community. Uh, I know they're a little different than uh, what we experience in Portland. So we've been trying in Portland to provide more separation where we can, uh, where we have space. In this case, this West Burnside 19th, we actually took away a travel lane. You can see the striping removed there and put in the concrete barrier to, just as Peter described, put a cyclist a little bit further ahead than the cars, giving them a head start and then identifying that yeah, they would have priority entering the intersection upon getting a green at this intersection. So another one of those treatments, not only to use signal timing, but to also use the geometry of the intersection to make people feel more comfort and, and increase the safety. You can think about if you are making a right turn at that intersection, that that's a slower move because of that concrete barrier that's there. Peter, do you wanna add something to that? That the, the the geometry, like you said, um, really complements uh, the traffic signal work. And uh, uh, what I've, what we've seen is that American cities have been incredibly innovative in finding low cost ways to make islands. <laughs> Just put up a few poles, some paint it a little bit, and uh, so we we don't have to wait, you know, a long long time for capital budget. Uh, and sometimes we can get those geometric changes done quickly. Now, there was a question in the chat about, well, what do you do about low, uh, you know, low sighted uh, blind pedestrians? And I think that's that's an area where, yeah, we're learning a bit about how do we uh, do a better job in terms of taking advantage of the shorter crossing distance. In this case, you can see the pedestrian button is still on that uh, on that corner. We haven't taken advantage of the whole in the median there. So that's just one of those, I think, aspects that, you know, I think a little bit more clarity about how to do that is on the agenda as we move forward to, you know, more of these designs in the future. The, oh, that, and that's the look at the far side of the intersection there. So a little bit more information 
for you in terms of how how that you know that then carries through the intersection. So uh, I'll just jump into a little bit of the signalization principles, maybe give you a preview of what you'll see if you tune in July 13th. Um, you know that so you know this NACTO and we we covered some of these in the past PBIC webinar on this topic. So you can always go back and look at that. I'm sure uh, Dan will have that available in the chat. Uh, and you know this notion. This is from the Urban Street Design Guide that NACTO produced. You know, shortening cycle lengths. I'd say, gosh, it's actually you know we we want to shorten cycle lengths, but at the same time, if we want to provide additional signal phases at the intersection to protect left turns or right turns, that may drive the cycle length up. So there isn't a. Uh, it's it's not that we have a one size fits all solution here. We have to really think about the range of situations. Hopefully, Peter and I have given you that sense, gosh, we should do a little bit better job with thinking about the range of solutions at an intersection and thinking about how we use detection. As, as Peter mentioned, that believability, if we knew where all the users would be, we would make the signals more believable. But often we leave out detection, we, we leave out some of the accoutrements that we need to make the intersection smarter for everybody that's at the intersection. You know, this notion of signal coordination, maybe the eliminate signal coordination is the way forward. And rethinking the use to detection are, are two things I'll leave you with and that we will jump into a bit more in July. Uh, you know, this eliminating traffic signal coordination, if I think about it in the Netherlands, you end up, you know, with better response of than more responsive traffic signals. And so that fully actuated signal is just, that's a, you know, it's okay to ask your traffic engineer can we eliminate coordination to make it better for people walking and biking crossing the street? Uh, and there's a quick source. We've done this in Portland. It's not a not something you can't do. We 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 can we do have that flexibility in some of these intersections, even where we maybe don't have the detection that's the, that we would want at every situation. A key element to this that Peter's mentioned is slow speeds. And so that's that's another element that I can't stress enough that safety is going to be a function of speed. Uh, multimodal traffic benefits from shorter cycle lengths. That's clear if you think about transit and that making stops at intersections. I think I learned that from Peter actually. Uh, so I don't, you know, that's something we can we could talk a little bit more about in the July session as well. So that'll be in there. I, I, we have confirmed that the city of Seattle is going to uh, join us as a as they've gone through a signal traffic signal policy uh, work uh, to try to figure out how best to meet all the needs as as they're uh, looking at uh, a range of solutions for Vision Zero uh, and meeting the equity needs that Darren and Eddie started off with. And with that. I'll conclude. I think Darren, you do have some questions for us. Sounds like the chat's been very active. I know I was trying to answer a few of those during Peter's presentation. I don't know if I've done a very good job with that. Uh, yeah. But hopefully there's a lot of there's a lot of activity and excitement around this topic. A lot, yeah, for sure. And so so many different issues that um you got into today that people have questions about. A lot that you didn't get into, people ask about uh, scrambles. Um, you know, a lot of other topics that we may not get into today, but maybe that's uh, skewed up for uh, part two. So I am sending the link out to register for part two. I, I apologize to everyone that we don't have more time for uh, questions today. I do know for a fact, Peter and Peter will be getting into a, a lot of other issues during that session. I hope that you'll be able to, to attend. Uh, both will be recorded and made available. Um, I'm gonna go through some questions that were asked quite a bit. Uh, so Peter, um, I thought it'd be, you know, be prudent for us to handle this topic that came up uh, time and time again on emergency vehicle preemption. We, we've set this goal of uh, Peter Firth, you know, extending, making our walk cycles as long as possible. Lots of questions about emergency vehicle preemption, transit preemption, tra pr transit priority, um, how you balance these uh, together and make it all work. Uh, so I wonder if you all might uh, weigh in on that. Yeah, sure. I want to say, first of all, there are some people who really care about pedestrians and they care about transit but there are a lot of people who just care about cars and want to say that stuff to just blow everything up uh the um any any place any corridor with transit has pedestrians the two always go together and uh the the impact on on so sometimes when you, you want to make a really good plan for uh, for transit and you say, so instead of the, the 
pedestrian walk than it being 20 seconds long, you're gonna make it 10 seconds long. And that might help, sure, that's, that, that's fine. But um, what transit wants and what pedestrians want mostly are short cycles. Uh, it, our, our common enemy, I, I don't like to use war terms, sorry, but our common enemy is that there's this standard way of just do it all for cars, do it all for cars. And if we just make it better, making it better for pedestrians and making it better for transit are mostly not in conflict. They mostly want the same thing. Uh, and emergency vehicles, come on, that, that that's a rare event. You know, when that rare event comes, yeah, preempt, no problem. Well, in most cases, the, the preemption event is happening on the main street. And so these are not mutually exclusive things. You know, the fire truck is coming down the major street. It's on the response route. It's going to the fire or going to the emergency. It, it's it's going to preempt. And, and that's, you know, that's it's probably already in that coordinated rest and walk feature. So I, I think, yeah, I think that's a that's a key issue. Uh, on the coordination uh, perspective, you know, I think the the notion of this is the preemption can work in both those cases. Um, I think we we do definitely benefit from uh, you know that flexibility within you know within a uh, that, that preemption happens to make sure that if we're doing something like a road diet that that fire uh, fire does get a premium service as they go down the street. So. That's a that's a one. I think the the transit priority one is a very interesting one, and and some of the signal controllers can reduce the walks uh, according to the needs of keeping in coordination, and that's a that's a very advanced strategy that definitely is worth pursuing. So yeah, we can obviously have a whole another webinar on that topic. Yeah, for much more important for transit priority is trying to shrink your intersection footprint and shrink the pedestrian crossing. Because uh, if, if, if the pedestrian uh, crossing, if it's really long, well, then you've got to give pedestrian clearance of you know, 30 seconds. And, and that's not flexible. You can't take that away for transit. And doing things like protected intersection uh, and road diets, uh, take, giving cars the space they need and nothing more, uh, often you can reduce your crosswalk lengths uh, by a lot. And that lets the pedestrian clearance be a lot less and that will give you more effective transit priority. There were a few questions uh, that were sort of getting at this topic of uh, rather than kind of location specific treatments or changes you might make at a one location or another, communities thinking about broad, more systemic or systematic upgrades to signals throughout their communities, big changes that you might think of doing network or system wide uh, is there would you would you rattle off maybe a short list of things that most communities can consider doing upgrade wise that that should really be done at every signal go ahead and make this a laundry list of if you've got the funding to do it these are the sorts of changes you want to go ahead and deploy uh, at, at many locations versus something you might do only at one spot or another I think we've we've lost a bit of the focus on just basic upgrades. I think Eddie mentioned the notion of just signal retiming. You know, those programs are not often funded. I think a lot of our work seems to be around capital efforts and and and, and building something or rebuilding something. I think that's that's where operations and maintenance needs to have a, quite a bit more attention than what we have in most cases. I think the you know this notion of um, you know where we're making good use of detection and, and incorporating detection that's more multimodal. You know there's a lot of signals that you know still don't detect cyclists uh, very well, and that's a, I think a the bread and butter of making sure that uh, you know yeah if we don't have all this protection, all these great amenities, we at least provide the basic level of service uh, to to people at intersections. So. That's, that's clearly an aspect of this. I think the other part of that is, you know, uh, you know, this weighing coordination versus, you know, long, you know, or avoiding longer cyclings perhaps is a, is is a is I think a key aspect of thinking about how we're transforming things from a system perspective. I think you'll see, you'll hear a little bit about that from Seattle of how they've kind of, you know, really put the put their pen to paper and said we're only going to allow a maximum cycle length of of X. 
uh, of a, or of 120 seconds or 150 seconds, depending on the situation. Yeah, I, I, in uh, cities where, where I've lived, some cities are, 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 are maybe more, more ahead and others are more behind. A simple review of are your walk intervals as long as they can be just for the given intersection. Some places they just don't have even the simple rest and walk setting. Uh, and uh, then a lot of intersections really ask, can we shorten the crossings? Can we can we you know do intersection bulb outs and so on? And then with a shorter crossing, less pedestrian uh, clearance time is needed, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, we need to go to a norm in which 100 seconds is considered a long cycle, the longest that we ever want to have in an urban area where there's pedestrians and bikes, and that where possible, we want to try to get have 45, 55, 60 second cycles. And, uh, and then on coordination, um, where intersections are very close, yes, we need coordination. There's no question about that. But uh, where there's a bigger gap, you can break a street into smaller coordination zones and take and 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 uh, uh, we can so yeah we already said that so those are those are the policies I'd work on. So Dan, I know we didn't have time for all the questions. I think that's a effort that I think we'll definitely do in the next uh, four weeks. Is take all your questions. Sure, those are included in that July session. So if that's not a reason for you to come to the next session, uh, I don't know what is. So. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Dan, want to um, add a, a few parting words there? Yeah, well, I was hoping to add a parting question for you all. Uh, we did get some questions about research, a lot of interest in some of the Cambridge uh, research that Peter Firth mentioned. Uh, I think it was Peter Firth mentioned out, out of the gate. Um, I, I think it'd be interesting for you all to say maybe a, a couple of things from your perspective about research needs in this area, that things we need to learn more about, about traffic. I mean, we know a lot, clearly. Uh, you've outlined uh, basic principles. What are some of these emerging topics or maybe new questions that we just don't, we haven't grappled with yet? Maybe we should. Uh, Peter Firth, uh, I don't know if you have any ideas. I know you're thick into research yourself. Well, we're doing some research on on how um, speeding and coordinated control go together and how, uh, whether either, either by taking intersections out of coordination or by changing the progression speed, changing the cycle lengths, and uh, you know, new new technology allows us to measure speeds and and and, and measure speeding uh, a lot more. Uh, and um, that's the first thing, Peter Koontz. Maybe you got you got some other ideas. Well, yeah, the, the element of equity in our work is, I think, really key. Darren teed that up at the top. I mean, I think that's where. You know, we, we've done a little bit of tracking in terms of maintenance and whether our whether our maintenance and operations are just responding to people that are complaining versus, you know, being proactive about where we can make safety improvements. I think that's a big element of, you know, uh, making sure that we're addressing historical inequities in our communities. And that's uh, you know, that's a part that uh, we definitely tying, tying our work to make sure that we are believable uh, and that our, our communities can say that we are putting equity first, if that's one of our policies, then, then I'll feel like we're doing a better job with our with our efforts. Uh, we have to walk the talk and, and, and make sure that we're, uh, you know, living up to our, the, the, what the politicians are saying our policies really are. Great points uh, all around. And, and um, as you were finishing that thought, Peter, I put up a slide. Uh, this is in the slide deck we posted. Contact information for our panelists. If you want to reach out to us, uh, we encourage you to do that. Uh, as Peter mentioned, what we're going to do is look at all these questions that came in, all these great questions that you all have, and think about them before our next session on July 13th, and really hopefully weave in a lot of this content um, and information you're you're interested in. I would just issue another challenge, or maybe uh, you know, next step for you all on this session. If you enjoyed this and you thought there are others in your community, maybe those who don't typically attend our PBIC webinars, some of your engineers who or in the signals world, maybe they want to sit in with you uh, during that IT session, uh, sharing that information with them. I think it'd be a great way to start some of those conversations in your community. So I'll be sending in my follow-up email later today, uh, a lot of information that we talked about today, but also a link to that session so you can sign up. Again, that's a free webinar from ITE. I know all of their webinars aren't free, this one is. Uh, so I do hope that you'll, you'll tune in and, and join us for that. Uh, a big thanks to our panel, um, Darren Buck, Eddie Curtis, Peter Kuntz, and Peter Firth. Um, We'll be joined by most of them next time, in addition to some folks from Seattle DOT. So we look forward to 
continuing that conversation. Uh, thanks to you all for uh, spending time with us today. I hope you enjoyed it and we will see you next time. Thank you.